How confident is K-State AD Gene Taylor in the current state of college athletics? Find out next. You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in Possible. Welcome into another Three Mob Podcast. I am John Kurtz, joined by just Cole Manbeck. Uh, obviously, our crew rotating a little bit through these interviews and the content from Big 12 Media Days, but appreciative of Derek and Cole for getting the job done there. Uh, Cole Manbeck, former beat writer for the Manhattan Mercury for K-State, and obviously key member here of the Three Mob team. The podcast today brought to you, as always, by Holiday Distillery. Make sure to check out their Ben Holiday Bottled and Bond Bourbon. 360 Vico, whichever it is that floats your boat. I'm sure uh, the boys have enjoyed some of that at uh, Big 12 Media Days down in Dallas. I unfortunately am not there to partake with them, and uh, I was jonesing for it a little bit today. I was I was missing missing the camaraderie of Big 12 Media Days, but we appreciate Holiday Distillery and all of their help as always. So we're going to hear from Gene Taylor uh, coming up in just a moment. I was not present for said interview, but obviously a very pertinent time to talk with uh, K-State's Athletic Director Cole with everything going on right now in conference realignment. A new commissioner unveiled today at Big 12 Media Days. There's there's just a lot going on. There is a lot to, uh, to talk to Gene about. Yeah, and, and part of what helped make my decision to come down to Big 12 Media Days, John, was just everything that's transpired over the last couple of weeks and the college football landscape and you know, Brett Yormark being introduced as the new commissioner of the Big 12 Conference, effective August 1st, him being down here speaking to the media, Bob Bowlesby as well. You know, a good time to talk to a lot of the athletic directors in the league that are typically present at the media day. And, you know, we were able to get here from Brett Yormark to start the day first thing in the morning. And then we, we caught up with Gene Taylor as well. And you'll hear some of the things that he had to say on realignment and also, you know, facility projects, everything, you name it, K-State, you know, looking forward to the football season, et cetera. We touch on all of that with uh, Gene Taylor. But I, I think first and foremost, today was the first opportunity to hear from Commissioner Yormark. Um, and I thought he came across, and I know you've seen, seen a lot of what he said, John. I thought he came across very confident. He obviously had written out a script, a four or five page um, script that he had read from and stayed on point to that and who can blame him with what's going on. He doesn't want to misspeak there. And he kind of stuck to the script throughout, you know, he was asked several questions. The, the very first question he got was from Randy Peterson at the Des Moines register, I believe, and was just very to the point. Are you going to add the, the four corner schools that are uh, being reported fairly widely? And yeah, obviously isn't going to address that necessarily. And then Ken Bowles of the Austin American statements followed it right up with a, uh, Typical Texas question of who's to say why the Big 12 is in a better position to poach the Pac-12 than the other way around. And obviously, Yormark, Commissioner Yormark stuck to the script here that he's very bullish on the Big 12. He used the word bullish. He, he believes in this conference and uh, what they can do and, and mentioned that they're open for business. Um, that can be taken multiple ways. But I uh, thought, thought it was interesting just hearing from him. First time really to get a chance to hear him speak. Heard a lot of confidence come through from him, but you're not going to learn a lot from these things because he's just not going to go into a lot of details, especially he made it very clear his effective date isn't until August 1st. And he has a 60 to 90 day plan that he wants once that effective date takes place where he wants to meet with he started meeting with all the ADs, but he wants to go through, meet, go to all the universities, et cetera. And he kind of outlined that plan. So I got the sense, John, and I don't know from you watching it if you got the same sense that this thing may drag out a little longer than we originally thought in terms of realignment. And maybe maybe we don't get an answer clear cut over the next few months on where the Pac-12 goes or the Big 12 goes and what transpires there. Maybe this goes into the spring of 2023. Oh, it's definitely the way it's trending, and and you can't tip your hand, you know, to anything that's actually happening. So I, I was not expecting your mark to really have much in the way of definitive comments there on what was going on. But, you know, watching that entire press conference, I, I just came away very impressed. I think the thing that really stands out is um, the, the fact that this is a guy that is just extremely confident. 
I think the confidence is really radiated there. I, he's not going to be intimidated by anything that comes with this job or this task. And and frankly, the other thing that really stood out to me that I just love is him talking about like, hey, we need to become hipper and cooler. Uh, he, he legitimately said that, like the, the brand needs to become hipper and cooler. And it needs to be something he used the word aspirational multiple times. It needs to be aspirational for athlete, like potential athletes coming up wanting to go play in the Big 12. And I, I think that is very much needed. Uh, nothing against Bob Bowlesby. Again, I don't – you know, you'll find people that will say he did a terrible job. You'll find people that say, how could you let the Texas-Oklahoma thing happen? I have a lot of understanding and, and empathy for him on that front, and I think he was better than a lot of people give him credit for. But he is kind of a dull, boring public figure, whereas on the other end, Brett Yormark is very much not. Like, younger, more dynamic, has worked in the entertainment world, coming from Rock Nation, Jay-Z's label, like – there, he is a he is a hip guy himself, and I think branding the Big Twelve as that is something that that really needs to be done. So yeah, yeah, that I would really stood out to me. I think that that is my biggest takeaway. Was not expecting to get any kind of real nugget uh, out of him, but it's it's reading between the lines and just taking what you can tell about his personality. I think that really matters. I, I would echo everything you said, and and from a branding perspective, I think that's certainly one of his strengths. When you look through his resume and what he did with NASCAR and the Winston Cup and. Uh, Rock Nation and all of his different uh, things that he's done throughout his career, he brings a unique perspective to the Big 12 Conference. And we'll hear Gene Taylor talk about that as well and how impressed he's been with him and all of the Big Big 12 ADs, actually. And they've had opportunities to meet with him uh, since he became named the commissioner. So um, confidence, that's the first thing that comes to mind. He inspires confidence when he speaks talks about things like you said and making the big 12 a more hip cool conference and using social media he hit on that he'd like to see the big 12 use more social media in different ways different avenues so i think he's got he's got a lot of ideas that it's just going to take a little bit of time to um take into action but i think over the next three to four months we're going to see a different look big 12 not necessarily in terms of new teams added but just in how the big 12 presents itself and brands itself very excited to see how they do that. I mean, that, that to me is, uh, I'm excited about uh, can we add schools and all of that. But I mean, you know me, I'm kind of a sucker for the branding. I'm a, I'm a sucker for how things come across. And I always want it to be cooler, younger, hipper. So I am I am definitely on board with that and definitely looking forward to it. But on that front, we are going to talk a little bit of realignment on the back end of this podcast. Just give you the latest update. Not that there's a ton really happening as it has kind of slowed down as Cole alluded to. But Colin D.Y. had a chance to uh, to sit down and talk with Gene Taylor. So let's uh, let's hear from K-State Athletic Director Gene Taylor on the aforementioned issues and everything happening right now in college athletics. All right. Welcome to another edition of the Three Mall Pod on the Kansas City Sports Network. We're grateful to be joined by Kansas State Athletic Director Gene Taylor. Gene, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be here and always exciting time, media days. You know, so football's going to be here. Just a, another quiet offseason. <laughs> nothing nothing has happened in, in the landscape of college football or college athletics, huh? Yeah, it's been a pretty boring uh, summer, at least the last few weeks in particular. Uh, you know, it's just, I think it's, I don't know if it's something we have to get used to every year, but uh, it's certainly something that nothing surprises me anymore. But it feels good, I'm sure, to not be the Pac-12 situation like last yeah. year when the Big 12 was the one getting raided. It's probably, it feels nice to get the shoe on a different foot. It really does. And, you know, I've talked to a few ADs that have been here, and when it all came down a week or so ago, you know, the text messages, you know, we feel a lot better right now than we did a year ago. I think there was a lot of uncertainty a year ago, some uncomfortableness for some of us. Um, and now some of the schools in the Pac-12 are having that same feeling. But right now, I would tell you, we all feel we're in the position of strength, uh, to be honest with you. Is the timing almost provide stability happening to you guys before the Pac-12? Was that almost a benefit? Absolutely. And I think what we did was, and credit to Bob Bowlesby, was went out and as one AD said, we got the four best athletes in the draft at the time. And when you look at, you know, Cincinnati made the CFP last year, and, you know, Houston's from a basketball perspective, and then their markets that they're in, uh, such as Florida and the BYU's got, you know, such a national brand and with their with their fans. And I really think that's why timing was good. And, you know, the Pac-12, if you think about it, there were some schools in our group that wanted to, that probably talked to the Pac-12 last year. And the Pac-12 said no, and now here they are, the shoes on the other foot, like you said. Do you think they regret maybe not? I'm guessing they probably maybe do regret that a little bit. Right? And now that 
you tell me it's reversed, will talk specific schools. Are you open to expanding to that part of the country? Well, I think it just, it has to make sense. And, and the commissioner talked about it a little bit. You know, right now our pie is, you know, right now being cut 14 ways, soon to be 12, whenever Texas and Oklahoma leave. Well, if that pie can grow by adding the right schools, that's a good thing. But if that pie stays the same and we add, you know, four more schools, now that pie gets a little, a little thinner. And I think we have to be very careful about that. But I'm, I'm, I'm for it if it makes sense and it brings value. And uh, absolutely. But as he said, like Big 12 is open for business, and we're going to turn, you know, go uh, turn over every stone we can. If, if the slice of pie, so to speak, stays even status quo uh at no one in the big 12 out of the current loses money but it just kind of stays at the same market is now divided up with four more schools but but no one's losing money is that a good thing as far as stability just by adding four schools like if you get to 16 you leave yourself in a more of like maybe becoming that more power conference along with the sec big 10 it's a possibility you know but again i think from because they're going to have so much you know ability their revenue generation with the, with the Big Ten and the TV, rev, you know, their TV agreement, the meteorite rights, and the SEC is going to be so much bigger than the rest of us. I still think we have to grow it to be somewhat. We're going to be competitive because that money that they're bringing in, they can still only give 85 scholarships in football. They can still only give 13 in basketball. That money will go to probably do facilities and, and pay for coaches and that. So we, we, I think we can still be competitive, but we do have to grow our revenue a, as much as we possibly can. Is it frustrating for you that we're going through this every off season nowadays, <laughs> it seems like, and we've kind of maybe lost sight of the geographic rivalries? Yeah, there's, there's no question. And, you know, right now it's it's a, because of everything that's going on, it's it's about money and revenue generation. And, and clearly, I think the Big Ten looked at their TV agreement and somebody said, you know what, if you bring UCLA and USC and then bring in the LA market, that's going to go up even more. So, uh, and obviously from a Big Ten perspective, there are certain academic and all that stuff, they're good academic schools. But um, yeah, it's it, you start looking about a student athlete flying from Los Angeles to New Jersey and back. Uh, that's quite a toll on athletes, no question. What's your take on playoff expansion, where that should go, and with the Big Ten and SEC kind of becoming as powerful as they are, do you worry about access to the playoff in the next phase of the Well, no, I think what's beneficial for me, because I'm fortunately on the CFP selection committee, um, if you expand to 12, at the end of the day, you're going to pick the 12 best teams. If, if, just because the Big Ten has 16 teams, we're going to pick the best teams out of that conference or any conference. And so I think it's about of the 12, how does that made up? Is it, you know, the, 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 each conference gets one selection that they're, they're number one and then it's, it's open to the other six or whatever the case may be. But knowing that how we select the teams for the four, we don't really look at what conference they're in. We look at what's the best team based on schedule and all the, you know, the things that we look at. So I'm not too worried about that. What's been your impression of Commissioner Yormark so far? I know you've gotten a chance to speak with him. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a couple of Zoom calls, uh, an introductory one, and then we had a kind of an update after about a week, and then I had a personal call with him, and then I just met him today personally for the first time. Very impressed. His background is incredible. I obviously didn't know much about him when he got hired, uh, but the more I learn about him and read about him, he's an impressive individual and he's going to be aggressive and that's a good thing. But obviously not a guy with college athletics experience but could there be value in that because he brings a unique perspective I, because college athletics is so different yeah nowadays. no you're right and i think it's changing it's almost changing every day with name image and likeness and all the things that are going about it i think his connections in the media world and and his ability to generate sponsorships and some of the deals that he's put together I think that brings a lot to the table and it does it brings a unique and fresh perspective that probably once we got past our blinders of all oh, we need somebody in the collegiate space which we all felt that way i think now that we've met him i think it's probably a good thing speaking up name image and likeness is there ever going to come a time now or in the future where maybe you pull back from you know reaching out to donors about athletic facilities because maybe you want to generate a larger when it comes to NIL and stuff like that. Well, I think what we, we're always going to need operational dollars, and those donors help a lot with their annual giving. And so that's what we talk to our donors about is if you're interested in NIL, that's great. We, we need help there, and, and you know, but we also still need your dollars 
we don't want you to pull your money away from us from facilities and and, and, and annual needs. If you want to give, go ahead and keep giving what you're given, but if you want to give a little extra, then you can give the NIL, but we still need you over here. And I think most of our donors are understanding that. Texas Tech announced this 200 million facility for our Texas football stadium recently. I feel like you guys, and we've touched on this before, are maybe ahead of the game a lot of these Big 12 schools and that you've already done over the last decade 300 plus yeah. million in facility projects and you're wrapping up the building champions phase over the next year. Right. Uh, so do you feel like you're maybe in a position of advantage over some of the other schools in the league because you've already done that? I, I do, and I, you know, hats off to the folks that were here before me and our donors that saw the value of investing in our facilities. I think that's huge. And, and we are, we're at a point now where I don't see a lot of major capital projects down the path, which again, could help us with not only operational dollars and operational needs, but you know, we do have a few things we still have to address, but in terms of the 60, 70, $100 million projects, I don't see those coming down the, the pike anytime soon. So I do feel we're a little bit ahead of many of the big 12 schools. Current facilities, you have some buildings going up as we speak. What's, what's the timetable on those? And is there anything after that? Well, the, the indoor football and practice facility uh, will be done sometime this November, probably November 22. And then the volleyball and Olympic training center will be done uh, in, in June of 23. And then after that, we still have to address the indoor track because Ahern is going away at some point. And we probably have to help our golf programs and our, and our tennis and the indoor facility uh, for both of those. So those will be a little ways away. And then, you know, we may go back to Bramlage and do some more upgrades to Bramlage, but it's, it's going to be down the road. Last, last one for, for me. Recruiting seems to be, you know, pointed up for, for football. I won't ask you the specifics because you can't really touch on it. But do you follow that? Like, how much of a recruiting fan are you? <laughs> well, I am simply because I get an opportunity to meet a lot of the recruits that they're highly interested in. Um, and then I feel great for our coaches because they have success with those with those kids that they want uh, I don't follow all the names, you know, I don't know everybody, but uh, I just know the coaches and, and, and Taylor Brad and the recruiting folks have done a really nice job this year and they're they're riding a pretty good wave right now, but you're good with Kansas kids. Are you watching the live streams of those kids when they're committing? And, uh, uh, some of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sitting there waiting anxiously. Yeah, yeah uh, some of them have been you know, pretty fun to watch and watch the build up for us. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, going back to, to Bramlage, I am curious. I, I feel like there was a plan, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gene, uh, a few years ago, 85 million was as part yeah. of the campaign. But is it just, is Bramlage a challenging facility to really- Yeah, it was, it was part of an overall capital, uh, you know, the review. Uh -huh. And there was, we threw a number on 85 to Bramlage, which we've touched a little bit on that, which was the, the, the addition of the North End Zone and then that seating area. Bramlage is, is unique um, because the way it was built, it's, it's a challenge to really change a lot of it. But I think we've done a few things initially. Now again, to really dive into that facility would be a, a significant overhaul. But uh, right now, we're just gonna kind of sit where we are and then let's see a couple years down the road what we might do. Uh, have the facility projects been impacted by the supply chain issues at all? A, or a, a little bit. Uh, but right now our projects are on time and on budget. We did something that was really smart. Our architects helped us that we put a down payment on all the steel over 18 months ago before the projects even started. And we got the price at that point of what steel was and we got it ordered. So all of our steel came in on time and that really helped us. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's a great idea. Um, talking football obviously we're a football media day how excited are you for this program and this year's team i mean this looks like it may be chris Kleiman's most talented roster it, 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 it feels that way and you know just listening to the players right they're they're genuinely excited about how they finish the spring and what they learn you know obviously coach Klein's bringing in a, a little unique look to the offensive uh, you've got, a, I think, a potentially a pretty salty defense uh, when you look at the number of D-line than we have. Our linebackers, obviously our two corners, you know, our safeties are, I think, probably the one area. And then, you know, you, you've got a pretty good offensive team coming back. So a lot of, a lot of excitement. And I think it's well-deserved. And then we just got to make sure we, we close it out once we get on the field. Last question, Jerome Tang, obviously he had a lot of work to do, assembled now, he's got 11 scholarship guys on the roster. What, <laughs> what are your impressions of what he has accomplished and just working with him over the it's last few months? It's funny, he that he called me the other day, he said, Gene, guess what? I said, what's that? He goes, we had 10 guys out there practicing today, so he was pretty, pretty excited about it. Uh, very impressed. I think the way he handled it when he 
he ended up with just two players. Uh, he didn't panic. Um, he went out and got, in his mind, the right athletes that he wants to have here. He just didn't take anybody out of the portal. He really did his homework. I think there may be one more kid that he's trying to get. Uh, now we'll see, uh, but when I watch them practice, they're they're long, they're athletic, and they're working hard. And that's, uh, I think in time, I think we're gonna be in great shape with that. Well, it's certainly an exciting time to be a Kansas State fan. Gene Taylor, we thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being Thanks here. For coming on. Enjoy your time at the Big 12 Media Days. Yeah, we will. Right. Thanks, see you guys. Gene. Thanks. All right, there you have it. There's Gene Taylor, K-State Athletic Director. Appreciate his time, as always, here on the 3 Mob Pod. We need to take a break. When we come back, we are going to uh, break down the latest in conference realignment, get you all up to speed. Of course, that could go out of date just like that, but right now it does seem to have slowed down a little bit. So more conference realignment in just a moment. All right, the 3 Mob Podcast continues. John Kurtz and Cole Manbeck here with you, about to talk some conference realignment. But first... Let's get in home field apparel, guys. I'm telling you, if you love K-State gear, which I know basically every single person listening to this podcast does, there is no better place to get it than home field apparel. Uh, They always seem to break the internet, break college football Twitter, break a fan base's Twitter when they release their new launches, uh, which happens once a week for 14 weeks straight. uh, They launch a new school. K-State is week nine in season four here for home field apparel. So, A lot of people have been waiting a long time for this. This is really high-quality gear. They take cool old logos. Uh, They just make awesome, awesome designs. Speaking of the Big 12 and Brett Yormark saying they need to be younger, cooler, and hipper, that's what home field apparel is when it comes to uh, K-State gear. So this is really exciting. It's coming up. Uh, You're going to be able to get it on the 16th. Everything goes live at uh, 11 o'clock Central Time on the 16th. So get your wallets ready, but not too ready because we do have a, a special promo code for you. It is 15% off using 3 ma at checkout at homefieldapparel.com. That's all you have to do. Homefieldapparel.com, starting on the 16th at 11 o'clock, and just use promo code 3 ma at checkout to get 15% off. We've already seen the designs. They're pretty sweet, and uh, we've got some gear coming our way that I can't wait to rock, uh, probably here on a future pod for you and at uh, Mini Cats games coming up this fall. So, uh home field apparel promo code three mod go check it out this is like legitimately i was i was thrilled i was kind of geeking out cole can attest when i got the dm uh from home field apparel about about doing this uh i was very very excited about it so uh for anybody who loves the gear and cole i know you do love you some gear uh this, this is good stuff I think I've got uh, over 40 K-State clothing items hanging in my closet. I don't have an adult closet, and this only adds to it. Uh, got three more pieces coming from home field my way. Super excited, um, and I'm all for the retro stuff. And I think most K-State fans love the retro throwback gear, going back through the cool, cool logos that home field does. And uh, I think they're going to be pretty excited when they see some of these designs um, that will become available for purchase on July 16th. Promo code three ma people. Promo code three ma. That's an easy one to uh, to remember. All right. So Cole, you mentioned earlier, like conference realignment feels like it's it's slowing down, may trickle into the season, and I'm I'm very much leaning that way right now. Uh, let, let's get to the latest updates just from today, which again, you know, this stuff is like milk out on a counter. Like these updates can go bad very quickly, but. Uh, we're still getting it framed kind of like a Big 12, Pac-12 standoff. Um, and Dennis Dodd sort of framed it like that in a tweet today where he said, in general, the Big 12 is considered to have a slight leverage edge in what continues to be a stare down with the Pac-12 in who might eventually poach whom. Uh, and then John Wilner, who is the, the Pac-12 guy, he is the one that broke the story about USC and UCLA to the Big 10. He said, source, unless Pac-12 schools make a panic move, quote, I wouldn't be surprised if they go the whole season before the future of the conference is resolved. And another quote, there is no rush. So no rush right now and could go the whole season. I think there are a couple reasons for this. One, I think right now, like the Pac-12 is in this 30-day exclusive negotiating window for their TV contract. I think right now everybody like wants to see TV numbers, like projections from the networks, what can we possibly get out of this before making a decision? Because it really doesn't make sense to be making that decision, whether or not you're going to leave or not, before you do know what the financials of it will be. Because that's what it's all about, as we've learned. It's about dollars and cents. And USC and UCLA became very aware of what the Big Ten TV numbers were going to be as they were about to close on their TV deal, um, which which should be coming out any time now. And they started seeing like, hey, this is going to be more than double in the Big Ten, what we're making in the Pac-12. That's what we have to do for our future. 
I think it's going to be a similar type of deal here where they're, they're just going to need to get those reports back. And if the four corner schools are ultimately going to budge, it will have to be because somebody is showing them like, hey, man, this is what the Big 12 deal is looking like it could be. This is what your deal is looking like it could be. And there's going to be like a 15 to $20 million difference here potentially, which we did see some numbers floated today from Navigate, which is a firm that has been looking into this, um, that that is possible. There, the projections there extrapolated out would have the Big 12 at like a 15 to 20 mil advantage just with the four schools that are coming in now and the Pac-12 staying at 10. So I think that's really the the scenario that we're looking at right now and why it, it does feel like it's kind of come to a screeching halt. Yeah, like you said, John, I, I think it would take someone to panic in the Pac-12, a school or two, um, and then negotiate a deal with the Big 12 behind the scenes. At this time, though, I don't think that's going to happen. I think the, the Pac-12 is going to try and hold strong until they see the numbers. And, you know, as we were driving down to Arlington, we heard multiple media people on Sirius XM talking about, you know, really they, these conferences need to see the numbers from the TV and it takes time to get that together and digest it all and go through your board and your leadership and figure everything out and your next steps. And so I, I think that's really where this thing's at right now is it's, it's just going to take some time to get through all these numbers and really study the situation. It felt like early on there could be some panic, move quick. But I think everyone now is kind of hitting the pause button and a lot of it, you know, clearly is going to be dictated by Notre Dame as well. But we've had the SEC, you know, we've had reports, I believe Saturday down south had a story this week talking about the SEC, you know, multiple athletic directors from that conference talking about the conference feeling like they're ready to put a pause on expansion from their perspective. And they're very comfortable with the 16 teams they have. Now, we've heard that before and obviously things you know, more teams were added to conferences, but it really does feel like maybe it will slow down at this point and everyone's going to take a step back and reassess the lay of the land. And I think, you know, there'll be better answers over the, the next six to nine months on where this thing is headed. But the TV numbers you mentioned are significant. And if those hold to be true, it's hard to fathom that Kansas, that the Big 12 wouldn't be adding the four corner schools and perhaps even Oregon and Washington, that it would be enticing enough for them to jump ship to. Yeah, so this was Navigate's, uh, let's see, March 22nd report. And what Jeffrey Fuller did, who, if you go follow him on Twitter, it's jfuller72. He, he provides some really good statistical analysis throughout the year as well. Um, and what he did was he took USC and UCLA's projected dollars from the Pac-12 and added it to the Big Ten. So all he did is take research that was already out there from this firm Navigate that's been referenced by CBS Sports and a lot of outlets when they uh, talk about the potential TV numbers here. And he just flip-flop those over to the Big Ten, okay? And so what he got there is projected payout per team from 26 through 29, which is when these new deals would be. Uh, the Big 12 starting in 2026 with the four newcomers would be at 52.6 million, then 54.2, 55.8, 57.5, 5, whereas the Pac-12, instead of 52.6, they're starting at 38, and then going 38, 39, 40, 41. So there's your there's your difference of about uh, 15 million a year, which, again, is is very, very significant. And you do make a good point. The other reason that things are just kind of in a standstill from a global perspective is that the SEC has decided for right now, apparently, and again, could change very quickly, but apparently has decided for right now it's not in the best interest of them and the sport to, to go poach the ACC. I mean, that's that's really what we're talking about here. So there are, there are a couple of things with this. Like one, it would be a massive headache because there is that huge grant of rights for 14 years for the ACC. So you're talking about potentially 300 to $5 million to get out of that if you're one of those schools. Now they might try and fight it in court. There's been a lot of tough talk about that, but I'm, I'm guessing the SEC is looking at it like, look, we're already making a ton of money. It's hard to clear that monetary threshold anyway for one school that we bring in to actually up our value now because the money is so high. Why mess with this? Like, Why mess with having to go to court to do this Plus, a very wise thing that came out of that Saturday Down South report is actually the SEC saying, like, hey, we understand that some of the value here and why we're so valuable is because the sport as a whole is still very healthy. And I think they're basically looking at it like a lot of people have said. If we go down this road too far and it becomes just two conferences and nobody else, there could be diminishing returns on the money because we're going to lose so much interest from everybody else. So, yeah, they want to strengthen themselves and they already have a bunch and they have everybody else kind of teetering but they don't want to deliver the knockout blow right now because they're worried about what does that mean 15 years from now? Like, is there so much less interest in college football because so much of the country now is not invested regionally that our next contract, our third contract after that is not going to have 
nearly as much money in it as these do right now. So I think that all of that together is why things are kind of grinding to a stop right now. And then the closer we get toward football season, I just think the less likely you see something happen because hey, all these ADs, like they still have to worry about a normal year and a normal job and, and everything that's going on. So you're just going to see less get done as, as football. And, you know, I frame it as football, but obviously the fall sports season uh, gets going. And the last point you made, John, from the Saturday Down South article, I'm glad you brought it up because I think that's important. I've been trying to shout that um, for for two years now since this has really been going on, that if you eventually become two mega conferences and you turn away 20 right now power five schools, so let's just throw out a name, 15, 20 power five schools, institutions that kind of get thrown to the wayside and they're no longer involved at, at this level and having a chance at the college football playoff – you turn away 30 to 50 million people that would normally be turning on the TV on a college football Saturday and watching your games and other conferences. And if you eventually hurt that common fan and turn them and sour them away from your sport, the TV money is not going to be there 10 to 15 years down the road, you know, for these conferences to get these hundred million dollar deals per school, you know, billion dollar, one and a half billion dollar TV deals to continue to go on because I mean, is Oregon State, are Oregon State fans going to watch if they're cast aside? Washington State, you know, Kansas State, Iowa State, et cetera. It, it would really sour the common fan, especially as well. And and then the TV money and the advertising money, it starts to dwindle and it, it eventually hurts these power conference folks. So it's good to hear some common sense. Hopefully it's true. Come from the SEC of all places when it comes to this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, that was like a, that was a moment of like, introspection from the sec that i didn't really anticipate right now uh once again could change on a whim like i you know notre dame going to the big 10 obviously is another domino that could fall that could start all this back in motion but i don't know it seems like everybody all the way down to kansas you know i saw kellis tweeting about travis goff at kansas um preaching a much different tone than he did last year when on the literal day that the big 12 announced officially the additions of the four new schools he was talking about still shopping around for another league uh, it seems like Kansas has realized the reality of the situation right now and is is uh, that they're going to be stuck in this league. So, um, yeah, I think like all all corners of realignment now have calmed and settled a little bit in the last uh, in the last week or two. So, you know, by the time you hear this, depending on when you're listening to it, we're recording this on uh, Wednesday, July 13th. Let me just timestamp that just in case something uh, were to change. But um for right now that's where the situation sits and then that's good for k-state no news is good news right now i think for k-state unless the news is the big 12 adding teams from the pac-12 we shall see all right it's gonna wrap it up for this pod obviously we have plenty more coverage coming up from big 12 media days thanks in large part to cole and Derek. so uh, appreciate their work as always also appreciate tucker franklin behind the scenes and of course holiday distillery and uh, home field apparel make sure you use that code three ma starting on July 16th to uh, stock up on all the great home field apparel. For all those guys, I am John Kurtz. Thanks for listening to another Three Mob Pod. We'll talk to you soon.